the title of my talk today, I got them on these colored slides so I can see what I actually have up there on the board. But we began back in 2010 the Road to Sarah project, North Central Sarah. I know the gym's uh, uh, director of uh, Western Sarah. And, uh, and anyway, this grant was granted to us at, uh, in North Dakota State to take a look at uh, increasing profitability uh, through sustainable agricultural approaches. And uh, so Jim and I have been back and forth and as we go into it, there's some cattle here that are being fed. We have a cooperative arrangement between University of Wyoming, North Dakota State University, uh, in this SARE project, even though there's Western SARE involved here. Um, those two programs are not mixing together. But I titled this particular talk today, Increasing Sustainability. And I know some of you, I could probably get into a pretty good argument over what is the meaning of sustainability. And we could have a really good argument or a very negative argument, because how do you define it sometimes? And I know we get into that issue, it doesn't matter. Today we're gonna to talk about increasing sustainability, okay? And so, um, let me move forward. I've got a, um, yeah, going the right way. I've got a couple of objectives. My primary objective today here, if you can see these little footballs, oh, and by the way, you know you uh, lured our football coach away from North Dakota State University, and I hope he does well. There we go, we got a few fans already and they haven't even seen a game. Uh, at any rate, what I wanna do is I wanna take, and if you can see this, there are three centers, or three primary functions in that grant. The first one is beef production, or I guess on the other side is crop production, a diverse crop rotation. We have beef production, extended and alternative grazing for both cows and calves and yearlings. And under the crop production, we've got cash crops, we've got uh, grazing crops. And then in the center, we got soil health. And you know that soil and sun and water are the lifeblood of all living things. Okay? So if they're the lifeblood of all living things, then this particular project really focuses on soil health. Even though we're looking at beef production, we're looking at crops, because those are the things that we sell, but soil is what helps us get to that end point. That pound of beef, that pound of uh, flour, that pound of wheat, and so forth. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to get you set up on this project with this, what I have on the slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about soil health. I'm going to talk a little bit about crop rotation. And I'm going to talk a lot about beef production. Okay? And so as we move forward here this afternoon, the first thing I want to do is, is touch on a couple of points about soil health. Now you can't see that slide, but there's some dirt on there. If I took, uh, took a soil after I had planted cover crops and then planted corn, and I was doing some bulk density tests with an undergraduate student, so I rolled over a shovel full of soil. And I thought, that's a really good picture. So I took out my cell phone and got a picture of that, that soil. So you can see that clumping in that particular slot. All right? So we've got some clumping. What happens when we got soil health? It is the foundation of soil fertility, is it not? Soil health and, and uh, soil organic matter contribute to soil fertility, they contribute to water holding capacity, they contribute to water infiltration, they contribute to uh, um, reducing soil erosion. All of those very fine things really come about as we increase soil organic matter. And so soil organic matter is what we're really working on through the crop rotations, through the manures that we put back on the field from the beef cattle, is to improve soil. And we're gonna do, I think we were visiting earlier on in an earlier meeting, we're talking about one of the things we do, well, we can talk to producers about those things, but did they make any money? Didn't we talk about that? Will we make any money? Yeah, we can produce these crops, we can see this and that, but I, did I get any money for the 25, 35, 45 dollars that I invested in that cover crop? So that I could have a living root in the soil. Well, we better make some money doing that. Because if we don't make money, we're going backwards, right? And the bankers don't like going backwards. Now if you can see this, this is a crop rotation that we're studying up there. 
We're basically using a crop rotation that might be fairly common to, I don't know about here, but under this irrigation it certainly would be. The crop rotation is a five-year crop rotation that begins with spring wheat. In that spring wheat crop that follows it, we have a cover crop year. The cover crop, I'll get into that a little later. In the third year, we grow corn, just like you're seeing across the field here. There's a field of heat barley, an inner crop, crop, uh, crop that's growing here, followed up by some sunflowers that are over there. Okay, so that's the crop rotation. In this, in this uh, cover crop group, we've got a, a, a fall seed, a winter seeded crop. We've got a cover crop. Here we graze these. So I'm going to take a few minutes and I'm going to talk about each of these profit centers a little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit. As Jim said, you only got so much time, you better move. Okay, if you can see this, in that cover crop year, in this very top uh, left corner for you, I'm standing in a, and it's about this tall, I'm standing in a triticale, winter triticale, hairy vetch crop. That winter triticale, hairy vetch, by the middle of June, has got to be in a bale. Has to be in a bale. And if you could see this picture, you would see up here that we've got some thunderstorm faults. Okay, we got to have germination. If we're going to get this cover crop to germinate, we have to have moisture. Otherwise, we got like we got here, dry dirt. And don't germinate in dry dirt. Okay? So in our country, we have to have that. We had this particular year, from the last week of June to the first week of July, we didn't have a rain. So if we're going to get that cover crop to germinate, I watch my cover crop lay there and look like this bare dirt. Nothing happened. Then we got the rain on the 1st of August. We started, and now it's about yay tall. Didn't do a thing until those rains came. So we were a little late. We're a later season in North Dakota this year, but this dry stuff is serious if you want cover crop to come and if we want a double crop. We're double cropping here. Here's your cover crop. You can't see it. Here's a little more mature. Here we've took taken after, in this case, we're using the cover crop. We are weaning the calves off these cows, and then those cows come in here to graze off the cover crop. You can see here, if you can, here's some snow, there's some residue. But I can't take and leave this thing stand out here and make any money. I gotta take and save some hay with these cows. I gotta graze that stuff off. I gotta use it. So if I use it, and I'm not abusing the land, I'm leaving residue under that cover crop, because this is the cover crop that I just showed you that soil picture. After the next year it became a cornfield, that's where that soil picture came from, following this particular cover crop. Okay? So it works. All right, here's the cover crop, what we're growing. And you, can, you can't see very much here, but here's a green, lush cover crop. Should turn some yearling steers into there. That'd be a great idea. That's one way to use it. We happen to be using it for the cows in this particular situation, but grazing yearling steers in here would be a great idea. Cows and calves would be another good idea. Whatever you want to do. Miles, it'll take it down. When it fits your program to take it down is in your best interest financially. But in our particular mix, happens to be some sunflower, a couple of pounds, some hundred leaf turnip, a pound, everleaf oak, 20 pounds, Ethiopian cabbage, a pound, uh, hairy vetch, five pounds, winter pea, uh, flex winter pea, 20 pounds. Winfred forage rate, a pound. Some of these brassicas are brassicas that do not form a great big bulb. These are more of a root type uh, brassica, and they stretch down a little bit further, and they're more grazing types. And they do this, uh, well, that last picture I have, you could see them if we could see it. Uh, they stay green way into the fall. December, January, we still have green leaves where um, are things like uh, pearl millet and, and oats and those other type of crops. You know, they're frozen up, gone, and blow away by the time, and that stuff still got green leaves. I just threw this in to tell you that now we're gonna move into this, into this part, the corn and the, and the pea barley, and talk about that part of the, of the project. And I don't know why I'm carrying that thing around. Just basically, we're gonna move now into the livestock component of this, of this project. Not the cows and calves, but to talk about yearling steers. Okay, yearling steers, we have a May-June calving herd, and so yearlings tend to fit into that, into that program quite well in terms of marketing, okay? And we tend to market these cattle into, into the first part of the, of the subsequent year. 
But what we're doing is we take calves that have been rough for the uh, winter. Basically, they're grazing some corn, some unharvested corn. They get some hay, because that you graze that off. They get some hay, and we give them a little bit of protein supplement, eight tenths of a pound or so, of a 37% crude protein supplement. But they'll gain about a pound a day over this winter from weaning till the 1st of May. 1st of May, we randomize these cows into three treatments. The first one is a feedlot. Straight feedlot treatment for those yearlings that come right here to, uh, to the Sarek Center where they're finished, okay? The second group, we break them into a third. The other third are gonna graze a perennial pastures, just perennial pastures. Now that'd be crested wheatgrass and native range. And the third group, a little bit more intense type of a project. More intense. A little more management. A little more moving of cattle. But perhaps a little bit more money left over. It seems like the more effort you put in, perhaps in this situation, the more money you get back. And I'll show you that. But this case, we've got perennial pasture plus those annual forages. The corn that you saw, the pea barley uh, intercrop that you looked at. Um, so in that forage sequence, we began with crested wheatgrass. We moved to uh, native range. We then come off of native range to field pea and barley. Once that's been grazed off, we move into the unharvested corn, just like that field right there. And from there, those cattle then come to Sarah, and they're finished. And once the cattle are finished, we haul them to uh, Carville in Fort Morgan, Colorado, where they're slaughtered. We then go into the packing plant, we get meat samples. I cut the strip loin of the, of the steak between the 12th and 13th rib out of the animal. We take it back, we do shear force, sensory panel evaluation of the meat to see if these kinds of abbreviated systems due to extended grazing, what kind of an impact do they have on eating quality and the consumer, okay? And so that's the project that we're working together with here with the, uh, with the scientists and the leadership here at CERC. Now you can't see this, but what I have here is a set of pictures that show you yearling steers on native pasture, a tractor swathing, field peas and parley because my goal is to trap the, 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 the uh, crude protein. The movement of these animals from one pasture type to the next pasture type is based on crude protein. Okay, So if I'm going to use crude protein as my barometer of when to move cattle, then it turns out with these cereals and the peas, they mature quite rapidly and because they mature, mature rapidly, I've got to trap that protein and I've done it by swap. Okay? And it seems to work pretty well. This is just some pictures of cow grazing swap, steers and corn, steers and frozen dry corn, because that's what happens to it. Looks like it should be combined, and I have combines. I think there's eight of them there. Okay? Here they are, they're at the butt of a big steer right here, uh, getting ready to load out to come to Sarek. Here they are at Sarek. We've got corn stalks that are left over right here. My grandson helped me get that cow's attention and our cows are grazing off corn stalks. So we're not leaving anything out there except manure on that field and that's our goal. We want to use all of this material. And by the way, the cows that are on corn stalks get about eight tenths of a pound a day of a crude protein supplement that's 33% crude protein. I'll walk you through, if you can see them, the big white letters. They're going to graze crested wheatgrass about 39 days, a month and a half or so. They're going to graze native pasture about 61 days, about two months. They're going to graze the field pea barley. You can see that's 27. Um, it's about a month of grazing in our field pea barley. And when we get down to the corn, it's, I got a range there of 55 to 77. So 66 days is your average on those on that time or that range to graze those. Here's a little bit of a, a bunch of bars. Maybe you can see those bars. Can you see them in the back? This is the heart and soul of the project right here. These are the crude protein values upon which I use to move the cattle. Okay. And so if you look up here, here's crested wheatgrass. When we went into the fields, crested wheatgrass is around 18% crude protein on the 1st of May. When we come out of those fields on the 15th of June, they're about eight and a half. So in between there, we've got about 12, 12 and a half, somewhere around there, in percent crude protein. That would be all right for that, the age of steer, wouldn't it, Brett? Sure. That's the idea, okay? So when we move into native pasture in the middle of June, 
we're about 13% crude protein, 12, 13%. And by the time we come out of that to move to the peas and barley, we're down around seven. Okay, so most of the time when we're grazing, we're in the more desirable, maybe a 10% crude protein range for those steers, okay? And yesterday, before we left to drive down here, we ultrasounded these steers and they were moved into the peas and barley yesterday into those fields. Over here in the bottom corner, we have the, uh, the pea and barley and there's double bars. There's red and blue bars. You probably can't see those, but that's, we took samples of the standing forage that we left behind and the swaths. And it turns out that our swaths, when we went in there, uh, we're around 15.5% crude protein. We come out though, I don't know, 12, 13, something like that. Uh, crude protein when we come out of those swaths. So they tend to hold their, hold their, their protein quite well in the swaths and, uh, and the gain uh, shows it. They, one, the, the, one, the last year of the study, they gained about three pounds a day on that pea bark, just not a long enough time of it. Uh, going into the corn, that's, uh, corn's a little iffy. And I say that because when we go into the corn here around the middle of September or thereabouts, we're about 14% crude protein. However, if we get frost, and we rupture those cells and the leaves, it just vaporizes our, our nitrogen, just goes gone. So we'll drop down around seven, but we've got corn grain in there. You know, so we've got grain still, but our protein drops. And so when we've got a fairly long grazing period in corn, we like to give them a little, little pinch of, of crude protein, and which we've studied for years, Brett, and it just works. It just works, it feeds that micro very well. This picture, you probably can't see it, but uh, Sungul, Dr. Santuclo, and I are working together here. We're ultrasounding steers. And what this picture is showing you is we looked at the pasture group and the pasture and the annual forage. And we had, in, as, as we looked at these uh, two-year averages, we find that those pasture cattle that, that don't get a chance because that grass is continuing to decline in crude protein quality, that because of that, you'll find that we've got about two, we have two square inch difference in ribeye area. And in terms of percent intramuscular fat, we've got about nine tenths of a score of an intramuscular fat score here. That's less for the, the pasture group versus the, the, uh, the sequence grazing system that had annual forages in there. And when we look at the number of feedlot days, the number of days on feed here at Sarek, you can see that those pasture plus annual forage cattle were 66 days versus 91, a month shorter time. Because while they're in the fields, you think, well, they're just out there standing around. No, they're out there building carcasses. We're building carcasses because of the protein that I showed you earlier on in those, well, it's a combination of protein and energy, but by putting, keeping high quality forage in front of those cattle, most of the time, we're building quality carcasses so that those cattle can step into the packer in a shorter amount of time, okay? So a little bit about grazing performance. Um, the grazing performance, these cattle, when they go out on grass, they spend about 182 days on grass. They average around a little over about 800 and 20 pounds when they went into the into the uh, pastures. Uh, our pasture group gained about 300 pounds. Our annual forage is 400 pounds. So about 100 pound advantage and gain for those cattle that were on the annual forages. Um, if you look at economics a little bit here, uh, this these dollars and cents were put together before this price of cattle spiked like it has. But we've got our farming costs, our cost per steer, our gross return per steer, and our net return per steer here at about 30, oh, looks like about $34 advantage for those annual forage steers just for the grazing component of the study. So we talked about increasing sustainability. This is one way we can do that by taking advantage of more grazing, putting more money in the producer's pocket rather than selling your genetics and let someone else put that money in their pocket. So trying to help you take advantage of Rethinking a paradigm shift from what you normally do. Most yearlings in our area leave uh, leave the area off of native pastures in late September, late uh, July, 
early to mid-August, they're gone. They get moved into feed yards, sold over Superior, whatever, okay? We're talking about taking them much longer, giving yourself an opportunity to put more money in your pocket with your cattle. And with today's step up in cattle prices, we can see a tremendous opportunity to put more, pot, more money away. And your banker will like that. Okay, in the feedlot. Now, this is at Sarek. Uh, starting weights were eight something, you know, in the pastures and in the feedlot. Here's your feedlot group. When our cattle came in here from the pastures, here's the, that annual forage group, pretty close to 1,200 pounds, uh, almost 1,100 pounds for the pasture group. You can see that those feedlot cattle at the end, they're finished weights. Now these are pay weights, these are, you know, with a 4% shrink on them, 96% of full weight. Uh, 1488 on your pasture group, 1479 on, so well, basically the same weight, a little lighter in the feedlot group. And uh, anyway, that's the numbers that we have here at CEREC. If you look at feed and feed efficiency, and we talked about residual feed intake, but uh, you can't do that without specialized equipment and measuring equipment, so we have just simply feed efficiency here, but you can see these cattle, these yearlings that come off of those pastures, even though they're doing fairly well performance, they still have a tremendous ability for compensatory growth. And because of that compensatory growth, uh, pushing around four and a half pounds a day versus 3.8 feed efficiency is really improved under, you know, traditional type of feed efficiency measurement, significantly improved over the, uh, the straight feedlot group, uh, feedlot control group. If we look at the number of days on feed, and this is a rather telling story, but you can see that our feedlot cattle died sooner. They were 18 months of age, and when we began working on this study, the Japanese market was a closed market to animals that were over 20 months of age. That, of course, is no longer an issue, but it was at that time. So we were looking at, oh, this looks like it works, but it takes longer than this conventional feedlot approach. And we're gaining only 3.8 pound, pounds a day, but they're doing it every day, so to speak. And our other cattle are having to catch up when they get to the feed yard. So they were a little bit older, 21 and 22 months of age compared to 18. No longer an issue now. But if we look at the number of days on feed in the feed lot, two months versus three months versus four and a half to five months, okay? If we look at heart carcass weight, you can also see that those, those uh, Grazing steers at a heavier hot carcass weight, a weight that I find to be quite desirable, around that 850 pound, the feedlot cattle were a little bit lighter. Marbling score was higher. Percent choice was a bit higher here. And uh, I guess the numbers are what they are. Okay, this is one, this is one of two slides that you wanna look real close at. Okay, feedlot cost per steer. Your investment in the feedlot, for the feedlot group, $578. For the all grass cattle, $381. And for those that spent only two months in the feedlot, $276. So what does that do to net return? And these cattle were sold on the grid. As you saw on the slides, they were sold and marketed on the grid. What does that slide tell you about increasing sustainability? Well, it tells you there's one way to lose your butt. It tells you another way where you can make some money. Now, let me tell you a story. And Jim called me on the phone. He said, you realize what corn costs? Uh, yeah, how much does it cost? A lot. And so, this trial, as you know, based on those dates, we're right during the massive drought in the Midwest. And corn that went into these cattle was $7.50 a bushel. The two-year average, 2011 corn was well around 550 to 6. 2012 it was well over seven dollars a bushel. Okay, some of the most difficult feeding times we've experienced. Right, under that situation, that annual forage grazing system showed us a profit of nine dollars a head. You say that's not very much. It sure beats a 308 dollar margin here. It beats the hell out of it, frankly. Okay. So I think we are increasing sustainability and I think we're making a difference, all right? So we're trying to help you here. Your friends that didn't come to this meeting, tell them about it. 
Okay? One of the things that I have run up against uh, since I started this kind of work, and really, many of you, do you know Trey Patterson? Any of you know Trey Patterson, Padlock Ranch? He and I started a project when, before he went to Padlock. Trey was a, a beef researcher with South Dakota State University at the West River Center over at Rapid City. Okay? He and I began doing some research in which we were early weaning calves. We were talking about early weaning and drought management. What do we do if we got a bad drought? Could we use corn? Even corn that's over, you know, only this tall. Can we use it to, to wean calves early? And if we wean calves early, what are we going to do? What are we going to feed us? Most guys say, I don't want to wean calves. I don't want to mess with the dang thing. Well, there's a way to do that without messing with it, without having to handle without having to feed them every day, and they don't get sick. Seriously, they don't get sick. First of all, if they're in corn, you can't find them anyway. If they were sick, because they're out, you can't. The only way you can find them is with a drone or an airplane. Try to find a calf in that corn over there. Anyway, trust me, when they're dispersed, they don't have anywhere near the, the health issues. They're not nose to nose, and they are drinking out of the same water, but just, it just simply don't have problems with them. So what we do is we wean those calves early. We put them in the feedlot seven to 10 days. We find seven days works real good. They get over the, uh, the weaning stress. They're not looking to crawl through fences, etc. You put them out in the fields, and they, they just stay in, they stay in the corn field. Stay in pretty well. If you need electricity, then that works. But they do stay put fairly well, but you don't want to put a weaned calf in there because they're like chickens, you know, they're gone. So by doing that, it's doing this weaning stress thing, getting them over that, then putting them out, we've had very good success. Trey and I were doing that. That was the forerunner to this fruit, this corn grazing research that, that we're doing now, is the work that Trey and I did earlier on in what used to be called, I think, uh, a four-state project. We had those that we were funded by a four-state uh, project. Anyway, when we were doing those, that was the beginning of this particular slide in which people were saying, you know, what in the world is the matter with you? Why would you graze corn? You only chop it or you combine it. You don't graze it. Many, many producers, they, today they're still shaking their head. What the hell's the matter with you? Why are you grazing that stuff? We chop it or we, or we combine it. That's what we got these big machines for. Okay, well that's fine. But if you look at this slide, you ask yourself, why are we combining it? If you look at this slide and you begin to look at the gain, the number of days, you take a look at the beef value at $202.05 a pound and the amount of money gross that you can take off an acre of that corn that's standing over there. And you look at the value and yesterday's Red Trail Energy Ethanol plant in Richardson, North Dakota, the corn was priced at two sixty a bushel. Now that two sixty a bushel is with a one dollar basis, negative basis off the board. So at two sixty they're paying and if you look at the basis going out for the next year, it goes from a minus a dollar to a minus seventy five cents to a minus sixty five cents to a minus forty five cents. So it gets a little bit better as we move into the, into the marketing year, but it doesn't get enough better to get you really excited. Uh, but there's trucks rolling because they gotta make room in the bins for the next corn crop, and it's a pretty good one coming. So here's, your co here's our farming cost per acre without combining and with combining. If you look at your net beef value per acre, we got $626, and if I look at our net corn value per acre, I got $12. I can hardly buy a pair of shoes for that anymore, okay? So the net beef increase over corn grain per acre is $614. Now that's increasing sustainability, all right? And a lot of my combine, my corn guys, they think in bushels. You know, they're the bushel guys, right? So the bushel guys, you gotta take your beef and turn it into a bushel so they can understand this, right? So for the bushel guys, that, that, that steer that's standing here, that corn is worth $7 a bushel, okay? So $7, it's $7 a bushel standing there on four legs, right? Okay, I don't know if you can see that or not. This is a line of carcasses hanging in the packing plant down at uh, 
Cargill, Port Morgan, Colorado, last January or March, something like that. This is a freezer beef. These are ribeyes that we cut out of those carcasses right there. But there's two things on that slide. First, there's the first study that we did. And secondly, there's the second study that we're working on right now, and there are cattle in the feedlot down here. The feedlot control group are down here. And for my three minute jump up thing, whatever you call that, I will be down there, Dr. Santucla will be down there in front of the pens, and we will, if you want to talk about, more about the new project, we'll be down there and talk about last year's data from a two, we do, I do this in two year increments because I don't like one year data. Too many things happen in two years that you don't see in one. And so I like a little more depth in that data to see that, and we repeat what you thought you thought you thought the year before, okay? So we're gonna be down there. But in the first study that we did, we found that when we took those different marketing methods, the grazing and the feedlot, short feedlot period, there was absolutely no difference in shear force or tenderness there was no difference in sensory panel tenderness, juiciness, or flavor. They couldn't, they couldn't identify a difference in any of the three ways that those cattle were produced. And yet we, as producers, can certainly see a difference in how much money we got back. So we produced a high quality restaurant type of meat for the consumer, and we made a really good profit for ourselves by using a little bit different way of thinking Instead of combining, we grazed. And so I want to introduce you, I want to introduce you to my red combine. My red combine has four legs, and these are uniform legs. You know, most combines got a great big tire, sometimes dual, and they got smaller steer tires, right? My combine has a cutter bar on the bottom of its mouth, just like the combine. My combine has a, a header on it that will vary with the ground as it goes up and down, whether uphill, downhill, on side hill. My combine will run on side hills. My combine has a processor in it. It processes, instead of processing actual grain, it processes volatile fatty acids. And my combine has a spreader behind. It spreads and moves this manure around as it comes out. Case IH has a, a chaff spreader as well. So my combine will compete with the uh, with all of the uh, paint you want, whether you like green paint, or red paint, or even yellow paint, uh, this red combine is a good combine. Works good for you. It works every day. It works day and night. It doesn't matter if it's raining. It can work in snow, and the sieves don't freeze up like they do when you're cutting sunflowers. Okay, you don't have to thaw them out. There's no problem, and the tires don't go flat. So, I introduce you to my red combine. And I thank you for taking the opportunity to drive here, whatever it costs you to get here, to listen to me ramble. <laughs> <laughs>